Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today we're talking about food. Meat shortages, supply chain disruptions, and increasing food insecurity. Both will leave millions hungry. I'll explain what effect the pandemic is having and then take a closer look with a man who has some key perspectives. Tom Vilsack, former governor, former secretary of agriculture, and he also serves on the board of directors of Feeding America. What does a four foot 10 beautician have to do with the nation's meat shortage? Ask Wendy's. The restaurant's old spokeswoman was an unwitting prophet. Where's the beef? Here we are, 36 years later, and we have a pandemic. And well, Wendy's, now we're asking you. This morning, new concerns about America's food supply. Fast food chain Wendy's becoming the latest company to feel the effects of a pandemic triggered meat shortage. Burgers have since vanished from hundreds of Wendy's restaurants. Now Wendy's still sells chicken and salad, but nobody gets the salad. The average American consumes more than 140 pounds of red meat every year, a record 2.5 pounds per week. And 2020 was supposed to be a banner year. Reduced tariffs brought on by trade agreements with Japan, South Korea, Mexico, and Canada spurred beef exports up 7% from this time a year ago. And don't get me started on pork. Back in 2018, another highly contagious virus called African swine fever swept China, killing millions of pigs and upping pork prices. American producers saw opportunity. They started shipping to China at a record pace, a condition of phase one of the trade deal. And yet now for the White House, soaring U.S. pork exports to China during a meat shortage at home may be hard to stomach. That said, to understand why your grocer is low on sirloin or God forbid bacon, you've got to look at the supply chain. In the U.S., roughly 50 slaughterhouses account for 98% of the nation's meat processing. It's a bottleneck, which means if just one of them shuts down, the effects ripple up and down the line, lowering revenue for farmers, reducing deliveries to grocers. And remember, if you're working on the line, you're slinging meats in a freeze box and you're shoulder to shoulder with hundreds of other coworkers. Thousands have already been infected that we know of with COVID-19. Hotspots are emerging. For instance, in Moore County, Texas, a rural region home to a huge meatpacking plant, 19 of every 1,000 residents are infected. That's a rate 10 times that of other major Texas cities. Meanwhile, the effects of the virus on food are starting to work their way across society. By one estimate, one in five American children under 12 are right now not getting enough to eat. In Iowa, where my guest is from, and where nearly a third of the nation's hogs are raised, at least 340,000 people are facing food insecurity, a product of a lockdown economy, poverty, and growing shortages. Former governor of Iowa and former secretary of agriculture, Tom Vilsack, very good to be with you, sir. Good to be with you. I remember at the beginning of this crisis, panic buying in grocery stores, even toilet paper, God forbid, uh, but then it left the headlines. Now it's back. Um, and we're hearing all sorts of problems with getting the food to where it needs to go. Um, what? Why are we talking about this right now? Well, we're talking about it because the virus has a cascading effect on the supply chain. Initially, uh, there was panic in the grocery stores, as you alluded to, and uh, essentially everything was taken off the shelves and people believed that we had a food shortage. We didn't. Um, and then about the time that got figured out, we were hit with unemployment, uh, massive unemployment, unexpected unemployment, sudden unemployment, which places a great strain on food banks. This was happening because we were shutting down schools. We were shutting down food service. We were shutting down restaurants, bars and taverns. And so 50 percent of the food that we normally would consume in those bars, taverns, schools, et cetera, had to go someplace. Well, there was no place for it to go because the food banks were not prepared to accept it, and the supply chain that exists today wasn't designed to get it to the food bank. It was designed to get it to McDonald's, to get it to the tavern, to get it to the school. As we're trying to figure out a way out of this crisis, as we're trying to figure out ways in which food banks can receive the food that they need, now that they have a 70% increase in demand, 
and they have no refrigeration, no storage capacity, how do we meet that crisis? But at the same time, how do we create a system that in the future, because this isn't the last time we're going to be dealing with something like this, how do we make sure that we can pivot more quickly? And I think one of the answers is that we're going to have to have shorter supply chains and, and, and more storage capacity, which means that we have a more resilient system, but maybe not as efficient or as profitable a system as we had before. When I hear more resilience and shorter supply chains and more capacity in case you know of a of a pandemic or something, another disruption in the future, I hear um, costs uh, for the average consumer are going to go up. Is I mean, how how dramatic do you think this is possibly going to be? Well, I think we really don't know the answer to the question of how dramatic it's going to be because we don't know at what point, what pain point the consumers are going to say uh, that's enough. Uh, I think it's fair to say that if you're looking at more processing facilities, maybe smaller and more, as opposed to larger and fewer, that's obviously going to be an expense that's going to have to be factored into the cost of hamburger and the cost of chicken, uh, the chicken breasts, et cetera. Uh, the question is, at what point will the consumer say, we're okay with a slight increase for more resilience because we don't like the disruption that we see today. We don't like to, to see the unemployment that we see today that the price we're willing to pay to avoid that in the future is a little bit higher uh, on the food side. Um, it, it may very well be that consumers make a different choice. Uh, and I think that's what we have to learn uh, from the response to this pandemic. Are people going to be willing to factor into their decision-making resiliency? Are companies and businesses willing to become more resilient and maybe slightly less profitable? Maybe not just in time inventory, but some stored inventory so the disruption is not as severe in the future. Do the people that are running these big companies that have experienced such extraordinary consolidation, do they, do they recognize, in your view, that this is a game changer for the way they need to run their companies? Or do you think they, most of them still see it as, I get through the next six, 12 months, we can probably go back to the way it was? Uh, I think it would be a serious mistake on the part of any business leader in the food and agriculture industry to assume that this is a one-off situation that we get through it and we're done with it. And given the fact that we're gonna to continue to travel, we're gonna to continue to have interactions with folks, the chances are very good that we're gonna see uh, pandemics of sorts in the future. How do we guard against it? How do we minimize the impact of it? That's the question. And I think every business leader is gonna cope with it and have to cope with this uh, to make a decision about, do I need more processing facilities? Do I need a shorter supply chain? Do I need storage? Uh, how am I going to deal with this when it comes again so I don't have to lay off lots of folks or I don't have to tell my customers I can't supply the goods because the, the, the workforce is, is ill? At the, at the same time that we have supply chains that are too efficient and not resilient enough, we also have an awful lot of workers that are getting sick, um, conditions that clearly uh, for the line workers at uh, these plants, these massive processing plants that were not built to handle a pandemic. Um, I mean, I know the Trump administration has been working to try to get these people back up and in the plant as fast as possible. Given that we don't even know what a safe workplace really looks like right now, what do you think these plants need to do to be able to open? Well, I, I think it's certainly important to get them open, but the question is getting them open safely uh, to the extent possible and minimizing the risk of a spread of the virus. Now, how do you do that? Well, uh, it seems to me that you have frequent testing uh, of the workers, uh, that you create uh, no incentive to encourage people to come to work, that you actually encourage folks, if they're not feeling well, to stay at home. I think you uh, look at your line speeds to determine whether or not you can continue that line speed safely. Uh, my suspicion is that you're gonna have to slow the process down a bit. Maybe you won't be able to produce quite as much or process quite as much product as you did before. Maybe you need to install uh, separation uh, equipment between workers, uh, plexiglass, things of that nature. Uh, you clearly have to have your workers have protective equipment uh, that is uh, top of the line and important for them and, and, and to send a message that you're concerned about their safety. Uh, you need to make sure that, that you are constantly uh, encouraging folks to take their temperature and things of that sort. We know from other countries that are doing a pretty good job of integrating back workforces in large office buildings and so forth. We, we know that there, there are ways to do this. Um, there's additional expense. There's no question about that. And it may, again, may result in 
uh, slightly less product being uh, processed in the same time frame, but at the end of the day, it will be less disruptive than shutting the plant down completely or having shutdowns periodically because you have a reoccurrence of the virus. One thing you didn't mention, and I'm a little surprised, um, is automation. And is it because this industry just isn't, it doesn't have the ability to automate uh, more dramatically despite this really unprecedented crisis? Well, I, I suspect that there will be some thought to that. Uh, that is not an easy process to, to automate. Uh, this is an incredibly difficult task. It's very physically demanding. Um, and it takes an awful lot of effort. Uh, and maybe there's a way in which you can cre create automation. Uh, but obviously, at this point, up to this point, the decision has been made that it is, uh, it, it is probably more profitable to do it the way it's been done. But I wouldn't be surprised that there aren't some people thinking right now, is there a way for us to automate, uh, to be more automate, uh, automated in this process? Uh, that's going to take time. Should the American public be ready for actual shortages of, of meat and related animal products here in the supermarkets at the stores? You know, I don't think there's going to be a shortage nationally. In other words, I think there's going to be uh, enough supply to, to feed uh, the American public. I mean, we about 30 percent of everything that's produced in this country gets exported. So we're obviously in a position where we can fulfill the needs uh, of people in this country. But there may be uh, local or regional disruptions because a plant closes, because of the nature of the supply chain today. Uh, there may be a shortage here or there, but overall, I think we're gonna, uh, I don't think anybody needs to be worried about whether or not there's gonna be enough food. The big challenge though, is to get food to the people that need it. When you've got 30 million unemployed folks, suddenly unemployed folks, there's a tremendous demand on food banks and pantries. And again, uh, most of what they would get from a donated standpoint historically has come from retail. Oh, well, retail doesn't have food to donate because we're buying it off the shelves. So the question is, how do we create a, a supply chain that, that will allow us to gradually re, you know, redirect the food that would otherwise go to food service to food banks to take some of the pressure off of them? And as food service comes back online, how do we make sure that we keep that supply chain uh, stable and healthy? If you were still Secretary of Agriculture, any immediate steps that haven't been taken that you would take to try to further stabilize uh, our food supply chain? Well, first of all, I think Secretary Purdue's got a really, really tough job. Um, and I, I know he and his team are working through it. But I think one thing that could be done, that I think should be done, uh, is to consider the ability of raising the, the SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, resource and benefit. Uh, the reality is you can send stimulus checks uh, in the mail and, and some folks get them and some folks don't get them and it takes a while for them to, to get them and some people use them to pay down their visa bill and that does that necessarily stimulate the economy? Uncertain. But what we do know from data and what we do know from history is that that SNAP benefit does get spent. It gets spent within 30 days, 95% of it gets spent. So to the extent that you provide those unemployed workers and their families the capacity to buy just a little bit more at the grocery store, the chances are that they will in fact do that. I'm wondering, um, do, do you think that the role that the governors have been playing in deciding to reopen the economy, the economy, the country, their states, has it been adequate? Is it appropriate? Are they doing a good job? Look, I was governor uh, during 9-11, uh, also governor during Katrina. Uh, and what I noticed during both of those crises was that there was a concerted effort on the part of the federal government and the state government to work collaboratively and cooperatively. And I think in a moment of crisis, especially a, a national crisis of this magnitude, that collaboration, that partnership is incredibly important. I, I don't sense that that's necessarily the case here. Uh, there's obviously a difference of opinion about when and how to open and reopen uh, uh, states. Uh, and so it, you don't have quite that alignment. So it's gonna be uh, it's sort of hit and miss here, I think. Uh, and it, it makes the governor's job much more difficult. Would you like to see a federally mandated plan to reopen, um, you know, either with guidelines like what the CDC has recently proposed or otherwise? Well, I don't know that a mandate's the right way. I, I, I think you look at this as a partnership and you understand and, and uh, you, you appreciate the fact that mayors and governors are on the front line, that they are dealing with their constituents on the ground level. Uh, and they need to have they need to have a very clear understanding of precisely 
what information they need to look at, what information they need to consider in making these decisions about that affect the life and safety and health and economic well-being of the people they care about. So I know it doesn't feel that way, but there is another issue um, in 2020 uh, that I need to ask you about uh, the election. You're a leading surrogate for the Biden campaign. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what is the most important advice uh, that you've given him so far? Well, I, I don't know that I've given him the important advice. I, I, I think uh, what I would say is that. I mean, if I had you as my surrogate, I'd be asking you for important advice. I mean, you've got well, <laughs> We had plenty of opportunity to spend time when he was campaigning in Iowa, and I think the thing that uh, I was able to impress upon the vice president was the importance of having a, a rural agenda and being able to speak specifically to and about rural folks in rural places uh, and the need for uh, an opportunity to, to, uh, to recreate, to, to re-energize the rural economy. And I think he sees that opportunity with, with his plan to uh, essentially get American agriculture to a net zero emission future. Uh, which will fundamentally uh, change uh, the dynamic in rural places. It'll create new income opportunities for farmers. It'll it'll allow for manufacturing to return to, to rural places. So I think from that standpoint, uh, his rural plan, I think, is a, is a reflection of the conversations we had. But I would say in this particular time, uh, the advice I would give him would, would be to continue to show the empathy that he has shown uh, throughout this process. Uh, leadership is about a lot of things, uh, and one of the most important aspects of leadership, especially during a time of crisis, is the ability to empathize, the ability to, to connect with people and basically understand what it must feel like to be unemployed, what it must feel like not to have enough to, to feed your family, uh, and to be able to convey a sense of understanding and that your desire would be to, to make that situation better. I think that's very, very important. Um, and I think he has the ability to do that and it would certainly encourage him to continue uh, displaying that, that, uh, that, uh, that part of his character, which I think is really important. Are you implying that, that empathy is not one of Trump's leading strengths as president? Well, I, I think the president just, uh, you know, he has, I think sometimes it's difficult for him. Um, I don't know why. Um, uh, I think he sees the world in a, in a much different way uh, than, than a lot of folks do. And, um, he's, uh, you know, he, I, I think he sees it, uh, as a, as a competition, uh, and obviously it is a competition, but in a time of crisis, it's really uh, ultimately about trying to figure out ways in which you can inspire people and, and, and ensure people, uh, a sense of security and confidence that things are headed in the right direction. Um, you know, I, I, I just got finished reading a book about Winston Churchill during, uh, World War II, and and you know it was pretty obvious that uh, while the while London was being bombed repeatedly, and the country was being bombed, that this was a a, a, tr a tremendous uh, leadership crisis and and challenge, and he was up to it, uh, and he he spoke often of of the unconquerable people. He essentially was able to make a connection with the people in Britain to make sure that he, they knew that he had total confidence in their ability to get through this. Uh, and because he conveyed that confidence, because he conveyed that sense of understanding and connection, uh, you know, he inspired the nation to, uh, to withstand a, a, a tremendous assault uh, and to ultimately triumph. Um, you know, I think that's part of leadership. And, uh, you know, you, you want that from your president, you want that from your governor, you want that from your mayor, you want that from your business leaders and, and, and elected officials so that you who are on the outside are, are in a position to think, well, they got it under control. Tom Bilsack, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. That's our show this week. And if you like what you see, and of course you do, because why else would you keep showing up? Are you a glutton for punishment? No, you should take a minute and sign up for our G Zero newsletter. It comes out almost every day. It's called Signal. Check us out.